Perfect. Welcome, everybody. We're now starting our second webinar of our Hidden Conflict series. Uh, we're working together with HIIK. Uh, in this series, we're organizing various posts and those three uh, webinars that we're having now past month, this month, and in November. And we are mainly talking about hidden conflicts in general. In the beginning, the, uh, the, the idea was to talk about forgotten wars, but this was a very uh, strong name to have to it. And we are also dealing with the discussions about what is a war, what is a conflict, and how this kind of dif differentiation uh, affects how hidden some conflicts are compared to others. And today, in our second webinar, we're going to have two guests here with us, other than our speakers from, from HIIK. So to give a brief introduction uh, uh, on the work from HIIK and a few words as well in this conflict that we are discussing today, I'm passing the word to Kat. So please, Kat, uh, mm -hmm. intro introduce yourself, talk a little bit about HIIK and what you have to say about this conflict to present HIOK's perspective. Yeah, gladly, and thank you very much for the invitation as well. Um, I hope you can hear me even though I'm on my phone, which is an unfortunate situation because I actually prepared a PowerPoint, but now I can't share it. Um, and I hope it doesn't um, disrupt in the middle of it. If so, please take over, Ilsa or, or Theo. Um, yeah, welcome everyone for, on behalf of the HIOK as well. Uh, for those who don't know, we are the Heidelberg Institute for International uh, Conflict Studies, and we publish the yearly conflict barometer. Um, so our perspective is mainly conflict analysis and reporting observation, which is why I, I'm glad to give the introduction, whereas everything that happens on the ground, every uh, scientific study is most likely better placed with the experts we have here today. Um, I'll just go through my notes a little and hope to just talk a little, a few minutes about the two conflicts that we'll be looking at today, right? Um, yeah, I'll start with the conflict or rather conflicts in, in Manipur. We see occasional violent clashes of militarized groups reported here, there. Um, and as it's a rather remote state of, of India in a, the generally rather underdeveloped Northeastern part, um, borders on Myanmar too, and the main uh, conflict actor we have here are, are Manipuri or Maitai uh, ethnic groups who uh, armed or militarized and started sort of revolution or, or liberation movements there. Um, so starting in the 1970s, these militant groups mostly gathered around the socialist, communist or otherwise um, leftist, sometimes Maoist political identities as well. And they started to form um, and according to our methodology, we categorize a, a conflict item usually, which is here the secession or in, some, in fewer cases autonomy. So the, the item is what they strive for. Um, and as in terms of conflict dynamics, it's a vertical um, dynamic or intrastate, which means the government or administration um, versus all those non-state militant groups. Some of these groups maintain cross regional ties, I think. There used to be some in Myanmar, of Naga groups, for example, and then the PLA uh, is, has a sort of government in exile in Bangladesh too. So there are several movements there, various militant groups that we observe. Um, as, as HIRK or the conflict barometer, we also have a separate conflict for the Naga, Nagalim, uh, as it spills over into another state, Nagaland, um, and also a separate one for the Ma People's Convention uh, Democracy, the HPCD, which, uh, who are also active in Mizoram and Assam. There is, I think we'll hear more about this later, rampant human tra trafficking, narcotics trade uh, by both conflict parties, I have to say, uh, which is the militant groups and the Indian military as well. And then the, the Assam rifles are also involved in the conflict as a paramilitary force. Most casualties are, according to our data, the militants themselves and civilians. Yeah, and our second focus today is on Bangladesh's east, the, the Chittagong Hill Tracks region. Uh, the group PCJSS roughly translates to United People's Party of the Chittagong Hill Tracks, uh, has been the main conflict actor here. 
Um, and thus we have it observed with a starting date around this foundation in 1972. Uh, it's about autonomy and subnational predominance as well of the Juma or Chakma tribal people. Um, they are mostly Buddhists and strive for as the PCJSS strives for the, their ethnic identity and rights. Um, and under the military Bangladeshi government in the 70s, or rather in the 60s already, there was forced a resettlement of them, uh, some of whom fled to India, and the authorities rather had Bengali people settle in the area. Um, so that conflict is, is both a sub-state dynamic, as there were intercommunal uh, violence and land disputes that arose from that, and also, again, the militant uh, groups that, that formed versus the government. So the militant activities were against civilians, both that and against Bangladeshi uh, army or training camps as well. Um, up until now, uh, because of the resettlement, there are still about 40% um, Juma, 40% Bengali Muslims. So that there's like an ethno-religious um, dynamic there as well in Chittagong. Uh, most of the militant action happened in the 1980s and 90s then, with the violent action. And we had a peace treaty in 1997, the Chittagong Hill Tracts Peace Court. Um, with it, the formerly active military wing of, of the political group PCJSS, the Shanti Bahini, was dissolved. But we still observe uh, violent clashes and radicalization to this day. Uh, so mainly PCJSS still demands the implementation of that peace accord even 20, almost 25 years uh, after. So a lot of the issues, including the discrimination and ongoing militarization, have still not been addressed. Yeah, that's about it for the overview, I think. I would have loved to have this on presentation and with more numbers and the, the maps as well, but this is what we mainly observe at JRK. And I'm very happy to hear more about it from our other two speakers. Okay. Everyone. Perfect. Thank you, Cathy. As as she said, uh, we, we we had a presentation, and she she ran through some technical problems there, but uh, I'm very happy that you came here, that you appeared to to talk with us to exactly present to us what are the information and the data that uh, the conflict barometer has that uh, HIIK has. So for anyone who's interested, you can go to HIIK's website. I can try to put here in our uh, chat as well, but uh, the intentions from our for for our series was to go a little beyond uh, this data, as exactly to show uh, a little bit more about uh, the conflicts uh, in the area. And for this reason, we have Hanna Ahmed here with us, and Bina Nipran with us. So. I'm going to to give the word to to Hannah, please. Uh, I, I I hope I'm saying your name right. <laughs> and just to give a, a brief introduction from my part, uh, Hannah, who's here with us, she's a PhD student of social anthropology at uh, York University in Canada and a graduate associate at the York Center for Asian Research. And Bina was the one to bring her here. So welcome, uh, please. Uh, I would like to ask you exactly uh, to extend this information that we just heard from Kat. Uh, and you can be very open with, uh, as we were discussing before, uh, we, well, me, uh, Hannah, Kat and Bina, we were talking a little bit about the, the posts that we are going to do this week in our social media. And they were very kind to highlight how there are some things that we have to approach differently. There are some ways to see the conflicts, the use of words. So please uh, just highlight those, those points to us and bring us a little bit more about your experience and the conflict at the, uh, at the place. So please, Hannah, you're welcome to speak. Um, thank you so much, Theo, and thank you, Katerina. Um, um, thanks to both of your organizations, uh, International Peace Bureau and uh, HIIK for inviting me to talk here. Um, so um, first of all, I'd like to ask like how much time do I have? Uh, that would help me. <laughs> uh, I, 
I would say that for now you you are free to talk for 10 15 minutes but later okay. if you want to add anything else during the discussion that we might have um, but feel free to to talk yeah okay that sounds good um so um yeah um uh katrina gave a very uh, good like a uh, summarized version of uh, the things uh, that are of concern in terms of militarization and military occupation of the Chittagong Hill Tracts. Um, and um, Tio also uh, pointed out uh, the work that I'm doing at the moment. Uh, so uh, I have actually just come back from Bangladesh in August. Um, so I spent six months uh, there uh, doing my PhD research. And before that, I, um, I because of COVID and other uh, issues, but mainly COVID, I couldn't go into my, uh, you know, to travel. Um, so in anthropology, we are required to do uh, a year's field work to, um, for our research, uh, but I couldn't go there earlier because of COVID. Uh, but I did collaborate with two indigenous activists um, and they were collecting data, information, interviews, on my behalf. Uh, so we had to kind of pivot in how we were going to collect data at that time. So, uh, but I did finally, I was able to go in February um, to um, finish the rest of my research and do a lot of interviews and some participant observation. Um, so I think how I'll start this is by um, kind of talking about um, one incident um, that um, uh, during my field work. Uh, so so uh, this was uh, 14th April, so it was the new year of um, um, the, the traditional new year of the uh, Juma indigenous people. Um, and so uh, me and an activist in, um, we were in Rangamati at that time, so this, um, activist and I, we were standing in the road um, and uh, waiting for some, other, uh, waiting to meet some other people there. And I um, was taking photos of the road because, you know, just um, because um, I wanted to know, make sure I had, um, you know, collected photos of where I've been, what I've done, who I've been with and all that. So I was taking these photos and I uh, accidentally took a photo of, uh, a military vehicle passing by and then I showed it to my friend who was an activist who was standing right next to me and I should showed it to him and I said oh look I just got this photo and suddenly the you know the military vehicle was passing by and he was very terrified he said you must delete this uh, photo immediately from your phone um that made me realize like uh or and also I think that kind of gives you an idea of how things are in the Chittagong Hill Tracks in terms of um, the fear um, and the control that is exercised upon the indigenous activists there. Um, and I spent six months doing interviews of uh, indigenous activists. And that is one of the things that I um, saw uh, during my interviews. A lot of them were afraid of uh, saying certain things about the military or even talking about the military. Um, and even uh, sometimes they wouldn't use the term military. They would use um, terms like, you know, you know who I'm talking about, or if you know what I'm talking about, just not mentioning the military and um, um, trying to kind of convey their thoughts about being under military occupation and living with that fear in different languages, in different terms, in different like even physical movements, not even saying the, the word military to explain who is doing this. Um, so, um, and also to just uh, give a little bit of background of my work, I started my research like, uh, um, uh, doctoral research um, in 2017, but before that, uh, in Bangladesh, I have worked as a journalist as well as um, 
I have worked as a coordinator for an advocacy body, the International Chittagong Hill Treks Commission, uh, whose work is to basically monitor the human rights violations in the Chittagong Hill Tracks. So I've worked there um, as the coordinator from 2000. Um, nine to 2015 officially. And after that, I um, started my, um, I basically came back to academia and first did a master's and uh, enrolled into the, uh, into a PhD program. Uh, but even during my work, so kind of my um, research and my understanding and my um, experiences goes back to, from 2009. Um, when I uh, started working there. So, um, and during our work, uh, we experienced a lot of um, impediments in our work. So we would have uh, intelligence agents uh, coming into our workshops, uh, intimidating us. And uh, ultimately from 2011 to 2014, whenever we tried to give visit uh, the Chittagong Hill Tracks to talk to, uh, the victims of um, land loss, we were never able to do it in peace. We were basically uh, surrounded. And in the end, in 2014, um, there was a big attack on us, um, um, on our car. And uh, we realized that we wouldn't be able to do these fact-finding missions as, you know, Chittagong Hill Tracks Commission anymore because um, of how our work was being um, stopped or being, we were being intimidated by um, the intelligence. Um, okay, so that's a little bit about uh, background of my work, but uh, so if we talk about uh, the Chittagong Hill Tracks and the situation of militarization now, and uh, Katharina uh, already said a few things, but I want to uh, still go back and talk about it um, from the beginning as, uh, um, so as Katharina pointed out, uh, uh, you know, a peace accord, which is officially called the Chittagong Hill Tracks Accord of 1997 was signed, um, uh, but before that, in the 25 years uh, or so before that, in the 1970s and the 1980s, um, the um, Jumma indigenous people, which uh, contains not just the Chakmas, but uh, a total of like 11 different um, indigenous communities, uh, the Chakmas being the largest. Um, so they started uh, in 1972. One, uh, the country became an independent, um, became independent from Pakistan and the indigenous people of the land basically said that, okay, we want recognition as ourselves because we're not Bengalis. We want to be recognized officially as with our own identities, Chakma, Marma, uh, Tripura, and um, the other identities that exist there. So this was seen as a threat by the Bangladesh government. So as soon as they demanded this, the, um, um, the military came in and decided that this is the only way they could quell or crush the um, movement by the indigenous people uh, was through, uh, through militarization. So they brought in as a, Katharina also pointed out 400,000 Bengali settlers. These are all like very poor um, landless people from different parts of Bangladesh and settled them there uh, to, um, to basically to grab the lands of the people belonging to the indigenous people, but also to work as a kind of uh, human shield for the military so that if uh, um, the indigenous people uh, tried to defend themselves and attack the military, then the attack would be on the Bengali settlers instead of the military. So that was kind of the thinking behind that. <clears throat> so since the 1970s, this uh, bringing of uh, settlers into that area has completely changed the way uh, the Chittagong Hill Tracts uh, region is. Um, and to also understand that the Chittagong Hill Tracks geographically is a very um, 
a very sensitive area because it shares borders with India in the Northeast, um, with Tripura and Mizoram, uh, and also shares borders with uh, Myanmar. So just to get an understanding of uh, the sensitivity of the region. Um, so that uh, happened. And then the CHT Accord was signed and everyone understood that the military would not completely disappear from that region, but uh, be um, present in like six cantonments, but to wrap up all their temporary um, uh, camps, which is uh, somewhere around 400 to 500 people. So sorry, 400 to 500 camps. And they would also wrap up their, um, um, you know, involvement with uh, the administration of that region, which was, you know, very clearly laid out in the accord. But what happened after that is, it's been 25 years since then, and that has not happened. So the military continues to exist, uh, and the military continues to be involved with the administrative uh, decisions. In fact, it is now de facto military rule. Nothing happens in that region without the military knowing about it, without the military having a say about it. Um, and be, and uh, earlier they had an um, operation which was called Operation Dabanol, which is um, which is a um, which was a military operation, but it was. Um, but the military operation continues today with well, Operation Uttoron, which basically means upliftment. So what they're doing now is um, maintaining their presence and maintaining their involvement, but not really um, in the overt way that they were before. Um, so for example, I'll just give some examples of how things are. I mean, my um, uh, earlier, uh, when I spoke about how the indigenous activist was afraid of the photo that I took, uh, it kind of gives you an idea of how things are there. So um, um, land related decisions are all taken by the military. Um, um, and then indigenous activists in the Chittagong Hill tracts are always under surveillance. Um, there's constant surveillance uh, on the activists there. Um, um, and also uh, there's um, NGOs who are working there. They have to follow certain protocols. They have to, there's a lot of, um, uh, the vetting is done by the military, whether an NGO can exist there, what kind of work they will do. And they are only accepted by um, uh, uh, they only get registration if they are working on very benign issues. So if you're talking about, if, it, if there's an NGO that says that they're going to work on indigenous people's rights, they will probably not get a registration. Um, and since 2011, uh, so what happened in 2011 was there was a, um, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, um, has a, their uh, annual conference in New York every year. And at that time, a special rapporteur um, gave a report about the situation of, um, in the Chittagong Hill tracks. And there were a number of recommendations that came from that uh, report. One of them was that um, the military, um, um, if they are going to take part in peacekeeping, peacekeeping operations uh, outside the country. Um, and just to add that the Bangladesh military in 2011 was the highest, they supplied the highest number of um, um, peacekeepers uh, in the world. So uh, UN peacekeeping, uh, uh, Bangladesh was one of the highest suppliers of UN peacekeepers. So the recommendation that came from the special rapporteur was that if the Bangladesh military are going to take part in peacekeeping operations outside the country, then they need to ensure that um, they have, um, you know, uh, their human rights record in Bangladesh is uh, clear, which seems like a very valid, you know, a recommendation, but this 
irked the government, it, this irked the military in Bangladesh very much. So since then, the strategy they have chosen in order to counter this is that there are no indigenous people in Bangladesh. So, it, uh, so the UN Permanent Forum should not be discussing in, uh, indigenous issues of Bangladesh in their forum. And they have continually maintained that since 2011. Every year on 9th August, which is International Indigenous Peoples Day, they issue all kinds of statements, all kinds of directives. Last year, they, sorry, this year, they issued a statement asking all um, uh, the media in Bangladesh not to use the term indigenous people when talking about um, the indigenous people in Bangladesh, basically. Uh, so um, this is the kind of power that they have and they uh, kind of uh, implement in that area. Uh, so um, along with that, they also have a lot of um, profit-making interest in the Chittagong Hill Track. So, the military are involved with uh, um, making um, tourist um, spots in the region. So a lot of the tourist um, attractions in, in the Chittagong Hill Tracks are directly run by the military. Um, and they also give protection to tourists uh, to reach those regions. And they've also created a kind of a, um, you know, uh, because there's um, a threat from so-called indigenous um, um, terrorists, which is the terms they use, um, the military provides protection to these uh, tourists. And those, so, so it makes for a very kind of an exciting tourist uh, a destination for uh, Bengalis who are coming from uh, the Chittagong, sorry, who are coming from Dhaka and other cities. Uh, they also um, have, um, um, so they also like in the last few years, they've realized that the uh, NGOs and other activists are tr really trying to empower uh, headmen and Karbari who are local leaders uh, in the region and who are involved with community building, community activism. And so they are trained by these NGOs uh, by bringing in experts, of course, indigenous experts on the region. So they are training these um, um, uh, headmen and Karbari to empower them in, at the local level. So what they, so what the military has been doing is now they are conducting their own training of the headmen and Karbaris. So they are basically, um, this is a method of intimidation, I think, um, to uh, make sure that they are involved with, um, they, they want to make sure that headmen and carveries know that who is the authority here. So these kind of trainings are a way of kind of in, intimidating them. Um, in 2020, there was a big protest against a hotel project that was going to happen in um, one of the districts in the Chittagong Hill Tracks in Mandorbon. But there was a huge protest against the hotel, which um, basically the land of uh, a lot of the indigenous uh, peoples in that region were going to be uh, evicted from their lands. Um, so ultimately, uh, there was an international outcry because, uh, you know, uh, a lot of international organizations like the International World Group for Indigenous Affairs and uh, um, uh, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, they got involved and they issued statements. So it became an international issue. It was stopped at that time. But since then, we have heard that in, uh, the indigenous activists have not been able to go into that area to see what's going on. So we suspect that the hotel project is still going on, but no one is able to actually see for themselves what is happening. Um, another um, uh, kind of um, intimidation process uh, by the military has been in recent times 
against the Chittagong Hill Tracts. Um, it's called the CHD Manual, which is a British, uh, um, a rule from a British Times, which would see the Chittagong Hill Tracts being managed and administered uh, as a separate uh, region because of uh, you know, uh, the existence of indigenous people there and their land and communal um, uh, community uh, ownership uh, of land uh, would be respected. It would be seen as a separate, um, it's, uh, it's part of the country, but it would be seen as a region that is going to be administered in, in, uh, in a different way from the rest of the country. So um, last year, I think, um, um, there was a, um, a review petition to uh, by, by uh, settlers in the uh, Chittagong Hill Tract. Uh, um, so this basically wants to uh, nullify this uh, the region, the special special status of the region. Um, so I, I just talked about a, li uh, a little bit about all the different things that are happening uh, and uh, just to uh, kind of give you an understanding of how militarization uh, works in this region. But, you know, I can go into more of that. I think uh, Bina also has something to share about the Northeastern um, part. That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I already have a lot of highlights that I would like to bring from from your words, but of course, now I'm going to pass the floor to Bina, who's here uh, also as a guest to talk from Manipur region, where she's from, but also as a voice from IPB, who can also uh, give some highlights on the work for peace that has to be developed uh, in face of such conflicts. So as, as well, Bina, uh, Bina Nepran, uh, uh, she's a humanitarian author and civil rights activist for the advocacy of gender rights and women-led disarmament movements. And she's also a great voice for the indigenous voice. So I'm giving the floor to you, Bina. Uh, you can in, uh, present yourself and also come with your presentation. Welcome, and thank you for being here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, um... Theo and uh, Kathy from HIIK, um, absolutely thrilled when this series of looking at the world's forgotten or hidden conflicts, because this is something that we've been working for for two decades, trying to highlight what's happening. I'm also delighted and also deeply saddened to hear what's happening in Bangladesh in the Chittagong Hill tracks. Um, these are we are similar people, similar region, but from Hannah, what she has described the state of affairs where they said the denial of the existence of indigenous people, uh, that is unacceptable, really, really tragic. And, and we will have to continue the effort. Having said that, um, again, I'm also the board member of the International Peace Bureau, which is co-convening this meeting. And, uh, we are trying very hard to get issues of not just the hidden conflicts, but also indigenous issues uh, of my, different ethnic minorities who have been left out of the radar. So this is a, one of the uh, first series and we'll be continuing to work on this in the, in the months and year to come. Having said this, uh, I will take us through uh, again very briefly what is happening and why are these conflicts hidden? Uh, Catherine had mentioned about what is happening in Manipur. Uh, uh, Catherine, you are quite out there. Uh, you are quite right in some ways, but uh, the the term of having the conflicts there as Maoist communists would be wrong because it was not about that at all. It was not about ideology in Manipur. The Manipur conflict is not about ideology. It's about how India took over our land, our territory and imposed the martial law for the last 64 years in Manipur and across the Northeast of India since 1958. So I would like to just uh, put that in. And, and that's precisely why we're having these conversations so that we learn uh, and unlearn. And then again, uh, uh, like find out how to understand these conflicts in a manner, because if we don't, 
we will never be able to have the right policies. Uh, the conflict in Chittagong Hill tracks, and same thing, the conflicts in Northeast of India. These are some of oldest conflicts in Asia. The Manipur and Northeast of India conflict did not start in the 70s. It started in the 1920s. It is one of Asia's longest running conflicts when the Naga movement started in 1920s. Um, so uh, I think really important uh, to have this. So to make it easier, I have brought presentation. The reason is it's important to visualize at the time when indigenous people's uh, history, their existence is being like completely like wipe being wiped out. It is really important to, to say we exist. And yesterday um, was commemorated as international uh, you know, Indigenous People Day in, in the United States and around in, in, in North America, and Indigenous people convene from different parts of Northeast to be able to say that they are strong, they're resilient, and in spite of the genocide, they continue to exist. And there's a similar story of Manipur and the Chittagong Hill Trek. So allow me to pull up my slides so that we could have a little bit of imagery. So uh, one thing I just wanted to just Put in context is whether Hannah is saying or I'm saying it's about indigenous communities. Now, who are indigenous people and where they are? There are about more, nearly 500 million across 90 countries and territories worldwide. And two thirds of them are in Asia, where Hannah and I come from. This is an image from Manipur. Um, and this is the other thing which I uh, would like to share. There are currently 21 known conflicts in the world and 376, of, of course, the numbers can change, but all we are saying is look at the magnitude of known versus unknown. That's why this series, Hidden Conflict, is so vital to you that we have to go get, because we need to pull out where are these crises to be able to help support, okay? And millions have been displaced in the conflict um, uh, and what is also critical where Hannah and I come from is this. 80% of the world's conflicts are now in biodiversity hotspots where indigenous people live. That is why you're repeatedly hearing um, words, uh, whether it's climate justice or whether it's you know, gender justice, or uh, we wor work at the cusp intersection of these three, indigenous, gender, climate, because these are all connected. And the reason is because, um, uh, the conflicts nowadays are in biodiversity. I mean, Chittagong Hill Track, I have been there. And it's one of the most beautiful and greenest part of Bangladesh. Really beautiful hills and valley and the food, the culture. I've lived there, I've stayed there and it's, it's really beautiful, but then it's under conflict um, for a long time. Now, okay, uh, this is a little map to put us in context where I am speaking about is this region called Manipur, where I was born, where Hannah uh, is, is from Bangladesh and the Chittagong Hill Track is around this area, okay? And so we are, the Chittagong Hill Track borders Northeast of India. Now, what is the Northeast of India? It is not a direction, by the way. It's home to 45 million people. I always say we are no direction and it is a very geostrategic importance. It borders, China, Bhutan, Nepal, Myanmar, and Bangladesh, five countries, home to 45 million indigenous people. Now, why is this area under conflict? It is under conflict because they were, the, like many of this region were never a part of India. Like Manipur, where I was born, we were never Indians. <laughs> In 1949, the, 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 the uh, government of India put our king under house arrest and force him to sign the merger agreement, which constitutional expert says it's null and void. So our struggle is not about any isms. It's about our nation state being taken over. So Britain was to co colonize the Indian subcontinent. And when British left, the Indian government colonizes. So it's a repeat of colonization. It is not about Maoism. It's not about communism. It's not about any isms, but it's about our struggle for our people for survival as a nation state. It, we were like an independent Asiatic nation state, like Bhutan. 
And this, you would have some of you must be hearing for the first time because our histories, not just the non-existence of indigenous people in Bangladesh as the government wants us to, our histories are not in the textbooks of India, the world's largest democracy. That's why not just you, Cathy and Theo, even Indians don't know about us properly. They think everyone who lives in this region is, is uncivilized, even though our constitution, we have two constitutions in Manipur, which was formed even before India drafted its own constitution. I'm researching constitution of Manipur dating to the 12th century. We have our own script, we have our own language, we have our own cuisine, we have our own way of life. So just to let you know why this conflict is not about a border conflict of India, it's a conflict about how decolonization has led to colonization of indigenous communities in our part of the world. This is a story of Chittagong Hill Tracks. This is a story of Manipur. Okay. So uh, uh, now, as I mentioned, currently, what is a state? As a result, we have 300,000 troops of Indian armed forces in the Northeast of India. And if you think India is the world's largest democracy, and we have a martial law imposed here for the last 64 years, nonstop, not even lifted for a year. So just imagine what it means for someone like me and someone who is currently there living and growing up. So for us, we did not see lockdowns because of COVID. We have seen lockdowns because of this internal war going on. Okay. Now, just to make you all feel a little better. These are Ari. They are the most beautiful part. This is Meghalaya with the waterfall. That's where my sister lives. And the other is Tripura, which is bordering where bulk of um, the, the you know, Juma people from Chittagong Hill Tracks, what happened is the Bangladesh government built the Kaptai Dam. And I think, Hannah, you can correct me. One of the things they did was they built a dam which displays like over 700,000. Hannah, is this the number right? 700,000? Uh, 100,000. 100,000. So they were displaced from Chittagong Hill Tracks and many of them cross over to where this white palace is, it's called Tripura, where many of them stayed. And then they also are now settled in different parts of the Northeast of India. This is Mizoram uh, and uh, this is the border regions. And currently where you see the little church, that's where more than 30,000 Burmese refugees have also crossed over since the military coup. So the region that we are bringing today, Theo and Cathy, this is a region where uh, uh, you know, where um, not much reporting is there. We are bordering China, Tibet, we are, and or all of that. So Manipur, where I was born, looks like this. In fact, it reminds me so much of Chittagong Hill Tracks when I visited it, very similar terrain. You know, you have rice fields and then you have little mountains, just to give an idea how people there look like. These are the indigenous people of Manipur, uh, and some of them Maitai or who are wearing funeral attire and then the Naga community, which is such a rich heritage. What I'm wearing today is woven by the people there. So both in Chittagong Hill Tracks as well as in Manipur, I have seen a similarity, women and people weave. We weave through our history, we weave through our sorrows, we weave through our repression, and we will weave through our colonization and emerge. So this is what's happening there. It's heavily colonized. It's a, what can I say? But look at the, these faces. If you meet them, do you think they're from India? So that's why when I first came to Delhi, I was asked which country I was from because our faces, uh, we are given a term in India called chinkies, means people with small eyes, snub nose, Chinese features. During COVID, we were told to go back to China. Um, though, uh, so, so just to let you know, the area that of, the, of India that I, which is now current India, where, where we are coming from, people's faces look like this, you see. So we have not just colonization, we have deep-seated racism and the policy of militarization, both in Manipur and Chittagong Hill Track is based on very racial profile, it's a very racist policy. And we have asked the government of India to remove the military from area. So now the question is, why don't you know about it? It's not just that our history is not in the textbooks of India. 
even you come to India with an Indian visa, you're not allowed in our parts. You will only be allowed after you get a permit called protected area or restricted area permit. And even if you come there, you are not allowed 11 kilometers from the capital. And so these are some of the things. So it's, um, and as I mentioned, the history of 45 million have been blanked out from this. I told you racially distinct. We had our George Floyd movement moment. And um, I, with many others, led this moment when an 18 year old boy that you are seeing in the picture, Nido Tanya, he was racially profiled, attacked and beaten to death in the streets of New Delhi. And we got uh, three months of protest to galvanize and got the government of India to recognize because just like government of Bangladesh says there's no indigenous people, government of India says there's no racism in India. Wait a minute, it's not the end. Government of India says there's no conflict in India. So we are not allowed to use the word women in conflict. We are told to use women in difficult circumstances. Talk about control of a language and how they try to. So racism during COVID I've mentioned, this is Manipur where I come from, as I mentioned, what happened in Manipur? Manipur was annexed by New Delhi as report in Shillong Times and this merger was unconstitutional. Manipur has its own constitution act, as I mentioned, Manipur Constitution Act was operational before uh, the sign of merger. This is our script. So not everyone indigenous is uncivilized. We have our own script, way of life. It's just that it has been complete. This is my father's book. He worked 13 years. I belong to intergenerational indigenous community, which has been trying to preserve our heritage and our culture. Because if we lose that, that's why we lose who we are. So we are defending it every single day to research, writing and our activism. So our work for peace is not a project, it's a commitment of a lifetime. So that's why we do. So the conflict, this is how Indian army operates in Manipur and Northeast of India. For every 20 Manipuris, we have one Indian army person. Such is the level of militarization. So Theo today, you have seen how people like ourselves haven't grown up in this region. This is how military stations are in Manipur and Northeast of India. And it is the same in Bangladesh in Jitagong Hill Tracks where Hannah has described. Now, it is not just the government, look at this, armed groups. So my research started not because I wanted to research gun violence, but in fact, I have come to Heidelberg University and I've actually spoken and actually written a paper on this one of my seminal research is mapping weapons from 13 countries flooding the Northeast of India. So imagine how would someone be who grew up in such an area? These are uh, different groups, heavily armed. And as I mentioned, the martial law is there. What does the martial law say? It means anyone is a suspect, including an unborn child. 45 million people are being told by the government of India, we don't trust you. We can shoot to kill you. We can rape you. We can kill you extrajudicially. We can make you disappear. And we cannot even go to courts. Now, why are these conflicts hidden? Because we are so violently repressed that they don't want you and the world to know. That is why conflicts are hidden because of the worst kind of violations that have happened placed in our parts of the world. It is not just about our culture, but our historic, our archeological sites are all militarized right now. Our schools and cinema halls were occupied. We have discovered mass graves and we heard about the Rohingya crisis, but before the Rohingya crisis, the Northeast of India had one of the highest displacement, you know, but no one talks about it because foreign journalists are not allowed in the Northeast of India. See, and just like what Hannah said, if NGOs are operating, you are supposed to do work on malaria or, or on, you know, uh, on things like, you know, how to get electrified a village, which is important, but again, on softer topics. So 50,000 lives have been lost in what is called the hidden conflict. It's not hidden for us. In fact, it stares at us in the face every single day. I've lost my 14 year old niece in a bomb blast in this region. And I have seen so many of my classmates and many of family who have died. 
mass graves in Manipur. Photographs of young men between the age of 14 to 40, uh, 19 to 40, who are suspected, shot and killed in extradition. These are images of women that we work with. The reason I started the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network was to realize to how to help many of these women who are widowed in this conflict. We don't call widows, we call them strong survivors. And we work with them now in 300 villages all across the Northeast of India. We have a huge case of rape as a weapon of war. This is an image of a 31 year old woman called Tangja Manorama was picked up in the middle of the night by Indian paramilitary. And we have a similar case in Chittagong Hill track of Kalmat Kalpana Chakma case, whose body has not been found till today. This is our Kalpana Chakma, Hana. Thangja Manoramas uh, was 11 security forces were involved in her rape and extrajudicial killing. Rape happens in India every 22 minutes. Why did this, her rape and murder shocked the country and um, got in, in Manipuri mothers to, uh, to uh, you know, disrobe and unfurl this banner, Indian army rapers, because she was shot seven times in her private part to destroy evidence of rape by the paramilitary. Is this how you defend a country? Is Tangja Manorama your enemy? And even if she was a suspect, couldn't you have given her a trial? And let me bring the connection between Bangladesh. India, like Bangladesh, also sends one of the highest peacekeeping troops. And many of the Indian peacekeeping troops operate in the northeast of India before they go to other parts of the world. I know there are some good fine soldiers too. I'm not painting every military as well. But all we are saying is if some military had committed rape, and sexual violence, they should be punished by rule of law, just as any civilian who committed that crime, anyone for that matter, including non-state armed groups. Anyone who commits violence against women in conflict zone must be. And I'll end with some uh, positive news. What is really strong that I have seen uh, uh, is we have an extraordinary indigenous women's movement and I'm so proud of it. I am and many of us are who we are because of the courage of indigenous mothers and grandmothers who are called Mayra Paibis, who patrol the streets at night with bamboo torches so that the children, the young people could remain safe. And we work very, very closely with them because the weaponization of our lives is continuing. So every, whenever there is an, a military convoy and women have come out, asking for the removal of the martial law. And our generation continued uh, by setting up the Manipur Women Gun Survivors Network. And then we hosted indigenous women peace initiatives across the eight Northeast states. And then we also work in research. We added and wrote on where are they? Because there are 17 peace talks in India's Northeast and not a single woman in, this, in it. We also drafted India's legislation on national plan on women, peace and security. And at the global level, we have worked very closely. And then uh, we have we, we asked for the repeal of the martial law. We asked for the demilitarization. We asked for the protection of women and indigenous rights defenders because they are so much at risk. Uh, we are asking for the inclusion of the history in the syllabus at all levels. We are asking for the setting up of a truth and reconciliation commission and implement UNHCR 1325 as well as many others uh, resolutions, uh, in short, and in, in short, so thank you so much. We call it Yam Nungai Jere in my language. Thank you. Thank you, Bina. This was powerful. That's the best word I can use here. And thank you for bringing this message. Uh, I, I would invite uh, everybody uh, who's around, who's watching and participating, if you want, to make questions, please put on the chat. And I'm also going to invite Bina and Hanna if you want to leave your mics open, just to have this dynamic of a conversation, because of course, if you want, uh, uh, I would like from, from both of your presentations, I would like to raise one question. And it really touched me because there's one word that appeared 
in both of your uh, presentations that is indigenous. And this marks me a lot. Uh, I, I, I have no space to talk about anything from my background, but being a Brazilian, I know that indigenous people there uh, struggle so much in regards uh, uh, to being recognized. And in, in the HIIK uh, uh, conflict barometer, the, uh, the conflict item that appears both for Bangladesh and, and the Chita uh, Congo Hill tracts and for uh, Manipur is autonomy. And I think this, uh, uh, this theme connects so much with the indigenous uh, theme. And yesterday, just yesterday in the US, we had the, uh, the indigenous day, right? If I'm not uh, wrong, but it's beautiful to have a day for it. But it, that's not enough, right? And I'm pretty sure that both of you know uh, how 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 does the word indigenous really connect with the word hidden everywhere in the world, and how this is a problem that is bringing conflicts, literally. So, can you talk uh, a little bit about how literally to, to me to me this is so uh, uh, so powerful, literally how indigenous people all around the world are putting hidden from sight, from news, from policy discussions, from economy, from participation in civil society. So being indigenous here, is that the main reason why those hidden, why those conflicts are hidden? No, it's not being indigenous. It mean, it's, it's a, it starts with the making of, of uh, it's about, it's, colonization uh, it's a mm -hmm. process which con and indigeneity is is a movement which is trying to resist as i said british uh, ruled india for how many years so many years like hundreds of years and mm -hmm. then they left in 1945 and then it started using the same colonial policy the armed forces special powers act was actually brought by the british in 1942 to thwart Mahatma Gandhi's Quit India movement. And they took that colonial law and put it on 45 million indigenous people there. So um, uh, yes, but it's like, as I said, people asked, so what is in 2020? What do you want? Where do you want? So um, for us, as I said, as long as people in the Northeast of India are treated like second class citizens, there is going to be struggle because it is not about, as I said, hunger. It's not about food. It's not about underdevelopment. Our region, by the way, Kathy had also used the word underdeveloped area. That's I wanted to correct. This region is one of the richest areas. The first oil of India was not dug in Mumbai. It was dug in Northeast of India. If you love Brit British breakfast tea, Earl Grey tea, it comes from Assam, the, our, this region that I'm describing in the Northeast. It has oil that is one of the most resource rich area of the, the, the area in Asia. So we are not poor. We have never been poor. It's just that our resources have been extracted and exploited. And our women, our bodies, they have been forced into sexual trafficking. They have been forced into, you know, they plant the Kaptai Dam in, in, in Chittagong Hill Trek, which resulted in over 100,000 plus displaced. In the Northeast of India, they're planning, you know how many dams? 100 dams to displace our people right now. You see, so uh, it, is, it is a fight for our survival. Uh, it's a fight for decolonization. It's a fight for deepening democracy the way we understand. And that's why we, Hannah and I work very closely with Elsa who works a lot on UN uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, an article there says Indigenous people's lands cannot be militarized without a pre prior and informed consent. So for your viewers, please read the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People drafted in 2007. These were literally made possible because of decades of work by, by indigenous people, particularly the Haudenosaunee people, 
who went through since the League of Nations in 1920s to get indigenous people's agenda on the global map so that it doesn't remain hidden, Theo. And I'll let uh, Hannah to reply. Yes. Um, no, I actually want to echo what Bina said and um, also want to thank her for making that connection between the Chittagong Hill Treks and Northeast India, because I think that's very important in terms of a lot of indigenous people who were displaced by um, the Kaptai Dang, 100,000 people, a lot of them ended up going to Tripura and also to Arunachal Pradesh. Um, unfortunately, they also faced a lot of discrimination there, and I don't think they had a citizenship until now. I don't know the recent status, uh, but I think that uh, connection is important, and it's also important to understand how colonization works and how colonization um, you know, resulted in these conflict situations in uh, in this region of Northeast and uh, the Chittagong Hill Tracks. Because in 1947, when the British left, they had this logic of, uh, you know, um, Muslim and uh, Hindus. So the Chittagong Hill Tracks region, which is a quite a large region, 10% of uh, the geographical area of Bangladesh, mm -hmm. um, but there were no Muslims there. I mean tiny number of Muslim, Muslims living there. So according to their partition logic, they should never have ended up in <laughs> as part of Pakistan. But you know, they, the British weren't really looking at all those things when they left. They just wanted to you know, get rid of the problem uh, and just escape from uh, that area. So what ended up is this, uh, this problem where, indigenous peoples, and the problem is with land. And I think in the um, uh, Northeast India as well, this is a big issue. And, uh, you know, Bina was talking about how beautiful the Chittagong Hill Tracks is, and also Northeast. I, I mean, the region is very similar. There are geographical similarities there. I haven't been to the Northeast, but I want to go there. Um, but I, I, from pictures, I can see that the, that the similarities are there. Um, hills and, um, uh, you know, a lot of land, but land that is not plain land. So the rest of Bangladesh is plain land. And the Chittagong Hill Rex is a very, very hilly area. Um, and the indigenous people who are living there, they have a certain way of their cultivation methods are different. Their uh, way of living is different. Um, and so when it became part of Pakistan and eventually part of Bangladesh, you know, you have all this land and everyone is just, you know, the state is dying to, you know, have control of this land. And so this is how they, you know, go ahead and, um, um, you know, um, another form of colonization um, that the Bangladesh government is mm -hmm. doing. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention was uh, about, uh, foreigners visiting the, uh, uh, you know, this region and Bina mentioned something along those lines and uh, in the Chittagong Hill Tracks, if you're a foreigner, you can't just go in there, you need a permission, but the permission is of a different kind. It's like, if you're going there as a tourist, you should have no trouble going there. Mm -hmm. But if you're like part of a human rights organization, if you're part of Amnesty International or you're a it. journalist, you are it's going to be very difficult for you to get permission. So they want it to be a tourist place that everyone visits, but if you're getting curious about it, its, its history, about its politics, then you're probably not going to be welcome. Um, and in terms of that, uh, I think um, Bina also mentioned about history. When we talk about Bangladesh history, it's about the Bengalis fight against Pakistan, which is also, which is a very important fight because Bengalis were being, you know, repressed uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. But no part of the history talks about the Chittagong Hill Tracks and what is what has happened there. So it's not mainstream history of Bangladesh does not include the Chittagong Hill Tracks. It is, you know, relegated to something, uh, an internal problem. It's not part of history. It's a, it's a problem that we're dealing with through the military, which is a huge, huge problem in the way that the state looks at the rights of human beings um, of that region. Perfect. And, and there are 
projects or ideas for the future for the inclusion of the indigenous cause in 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 power in the powers to to build and to bring peace to these conflicts as the voices of the indigenous people uh, being considered throughout this last uh, few few years or it's literally just getting worse each day that passes um i think in uh, can i go first pina okay so i think what is happening is there's like the indigenous activists are very um very active um and also i have to at this point say that i am i'm bengali i'm not an indigenous person i'm uh, a bengali person uh who works as an activist uh, and a researcher uh they are very active they are talking about uh, their problems all the time they are demanding from the government uh what their rights are but a lot of it is ignored a lot of it is um just not taken into consideration and the the media is so um complicit in all of this a lot of the things that are happening in the hill tracks are not being reported um it's just their alternative media they're like blogs that are run by activists that are constantly being uh, reporting about what is happening there but none of it almost almost none of it unless it's like really big and you can't ignore it anymore it doesn't come into the mainstream media so that uh, that is how this conflict is also monitored and maintained by making sure that only something that can no longer be ignored comes to the media other stuff like someone being picked up someone being harassed someone uh, having their home um you know uh, illegally intruded someone fall you know file a false case against someone there's so many hundreds of like false cases against activists none of it is in the media so that is how also another um way of controlling what is being said about the chitagong hill tracks in public domain um maybe even yeah um bina your microphone Yes. Between Hannah and me, I think we have covered quite a ground to bring to the fore that this region, which is just below China, <laughs> the northeast of India, extending towards Bangladesh, we are bordering China, we are bordering Myanmar, and we are bordering the world's largest democracy, India. Mm -hmm. And this region of home to like, like millions of indigenous people continue to be living under literally de facto military rule as Hannah has mentioned today. So I think to recognize this is first step, okay? Uh, and so we call upon, you know, people like HIAS Institute, IPB, as well as other scholars and activists to really look into this uh, as a research topic. I think it's really important, right? Number two is so to, to highlight what's happening there. The other thing is, all right, governments may be fed up with some of us by saying we're saying, but we're going to say it till it's resolved, you see. Mm -hmm. So what we need is it'll require really good advocacy work at the local level, national level, and international level. So that's why um, for Chittagong Hill Tracks, I'm so proud that I met such really good activists, you know, who have also from the former like uh, Chakma uh, Circle Chief Raja Jebeshish Roy and many others, they have been really at the international fora with the Chittagong Hill Track Commissions and others who are really doing their be best to highlight that. The, and then I've also met so many other incredible activists who are working on the ground um, for climate justice, also for rights, working in the cusp of that. And then we call upon, I think it's really critical for the Northeast of India, what is very interesting. And since it's a frank talk, let me be very clear. Very few human rights groups have come out of the Northeast of India, mm -hmm. very few. And if they do come out, then it's very few, like it's, it's, you can count it like two or three, not more. So for the people of Northeast of India, I am one of those oddballs who have tumbled out and, and speaking mm -hmm. about this, but we, we wish to get more voices to come out, you know, to speak on many of these forums. And, and then we also, I think, really, really critical that this sharing has to be done with more people. And finally, is to our governments. 
we are calling on the government of Bangladesh and the government of India to accept that rights violations have happened. That's why I, we are calling for a truth commission, a truth and reconciliatory commission, where it could be, a, that's a need of the hour. We, are, we actually, I'm so tired of speaking about this conflict again and again. We are also looking for mitigation techniques. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the governments of Bangladesh and India must acknowledge there's rights violations going on, give relief and reparations to those families who have lost loved ones, okay. start the healing process. And, 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 and of course, I know, I mean, people, we need to live and share things. But if you are saying we are going to come in and we're going to like commit a genocide so that we could live, that's also not done. I think those days should stop actually in Northeast of India and in Bangladesh, but live and let live. If there are rich resources, people of Northeast are willing to share it. But then till today, Government of India has taken 99% of the resources and plowed 1% back and mm -hmm. making us put in a category called other backward states. Other backward districts is a word used for that. Like I have traveled to each of these eight Northeast states and Hannah, by the way, you, are, you, are, you will extend an invitation, please come and visit us. And same with you, Theo. I think we got communities who are facing we have the process in short of decolonialization is not over yet for the people of Jitkongil tracks and the Northeast people. So we would like to join hands to continue this decolonial process. Unless our governance structure is decolonized, colonization will continue to seep through our policies, through our processes. And the martial law is a proof of that. It's a colonial law, which should be wiped out from nation stage which are celebrating its independence every year. Okay, so I think that's what we would really strongly advocate for. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, yes, I, I think it's a perfect session yeah. as we were intending to bring the word to give the floor to both of your voices to instruct and teach people a little bit more about uh, each one of the given areas. So thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Bina, for being here. Uh, I, I, I want to say once more, is there someone in the chat who would like to, to, to do a question? If you want, please just write in our chat. But I would, if not, I would just give the floor to, to Bina and to Hannah, if you would like to give any last words, if we don't have any questions, uh, to close the session. Hannah, Would you like um, well, very difficult to make last words, but I think one point that uh, Bina touched upon, and I think it's so important to do that. Uh, she talked about uh, healing, and uh, um, I, th I think that is something that has not even been, you know, talked about in the Chitagong mm -hmm. Hill tracks, mm -hmm. which is very unfortunate because we in Bangladesh we talk about uh, healing in terms of 1971 when Pakistan, uh, you know, um, um, you know, killed hundreds of thousands of people in Bangladesh. We talked, we talk about that healing. There's a lot of research going on in terms of that healing, and it's very important to do that. But at the same time, in the 70s and the 80s, when military carried out a number of massacres in the Chittagong Hill tracts. And, um, you know, uh, not just massacres, but like burning down villages and you're picking up uh, young and old uh, men, uh, indigenous men on suspicion of uh, being part of the insurgency so-called. Um, and there are so many stories, like when I went, uh, uh, this time when I did my interviews with, um, uh, a lot of the activists there, a lot of them talked about how, you know, their father or their brother or their grandfather were picked up and, you know, held uh, illegally completely. And there's like no records of that. There's just, it's just their stories. It, there's no official records of these people being picked up, tortured, intimidated, held by the military. And of course, the num as I said, the number of um, uh, massacres that were carried out in the hill tracks in those two decades. There has been no talk of any kind of healing. I mean, 
the activists right now who are working on these issues, the indigenous activists, they're talking about things that are happening now, like we need this, uh, we need that, we, you need to, this land is being taken over, you need to, uh, you know, immediately stop that. So it's like day-to-day -day things that are happening there that they're dealing with, but like the, the things that happened not too long ago, 70s, 80s is only like a few decades ago. So th that kind of healing, that kind of, those conversations are not even on the table because, you know, they're being kept busy with everything that is happening right now. Um, so I think it's very important to also address those that happened in the past, that, because you cannot deal with things that are happening right now without having dealt with what happened in the past. You, uh, Palaf Chakma has raised his hand. So I think we yes. should give the floor to him. Okay, I'm, I'm, so I'm inviting uh, Palaf to talk. Uh, Palaf, yes, can you? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, Veena, and thank you, Hannah. I was listening to each of your statement or uh, uh, your uh, your speeches <clears throat> and thank you from both of my uh, bottom of my heart for raising the issues of uh, Chittagong Hill Tribes as well as uh, Manipur and Northeast India and uh, you rightly expressed uh, uh, rightly uh, mentioned about the situation uh, here so I'm not going deep into it and I also I only want to mention that this year we are selling we are uh, going to observe the 25th year of uh, uh, anniversary of the Chittagong Hill Tax Accord. But uh, these long years, we have seen that the main provisions of the accord still un unaddressed. Uh, the, the major things is um, dissolving the land, land, land disputes, demilitarizing the, uh, the region, uh, uh, rehabilitation of the India repatriated refugees, Jumma refugees, and the internally displaced persons. So all these are the crucial issues for us. Mm -hmm. So uh, we should louder our voices that that uh, in, in and bringing need to bring these issues in, in our advocacy at local and international level. So uh, I also request all of you who are listening here, we should louder our voices and uh, all us. Uh, uh, need to uh, uh, influence the government uh, to, to implement or to fulfill the promise that they have given to the Jumma people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Palab, can you introduce yourself, Palab? Okay. Uh, I'm Paul Chakma. I'm working with the uh, Kapping Foundation and Human Rights Organizations uh, in Bangladesh, and I am also from Chittagong Hill Threats. Oh, Kapeng is a fantastic group. I think, uh, uh, I think Theo, we should, um, International Peace Bureau should invite uh, uh, you, you and the Kapeng Foundation. Actually, we should already plan that, as you said, this 25 years of the accord, I know um, uh, that the accord is named as a paper tiger <laughs> because it is like, it, it, it's there, but it didn't like, but I think, it's a good opportunity to actually address some of the issues, I think. And so, Palav, please stay in touch. Um, uh, do you have our emails? I don't know. Uh, you know, Theo, you can write the general email so we can get in touch. And okay. please, and the International Peace Bureau is the world's oldest peace organization, founded okay, in 1890. Okay, it would be our pleasure to be connected with this network. Yes, yes. So that's, uh, that's, uh, 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 the Berlin office, uh, and then that's I'm on the board, and we can we are going to meet next week. And this is my email, so please stay in touch. Uh, and I think it's really important, uh, as I said, all this as a part of healing, and also getting our the governments of both India and Bangladesh to say, look, when we are saying this, it's asking recognize what has happened so that we can start the process of healing. Otherwise, it is not, we are not going ahead as Hannah said. So thank you, Palav, for this. Yeah. Uh, I also want to add uh, uh, 
thanks, Paula, for coming and uh, adding that about the CHD Accord and the 25th anniversary. But I also want to add that Kaping Foundation is doing one of the most important things in terms of the Chittagong Hill Tracks, the documentation work, which I don't think anyone else is doing as well. Uh, they, uh, they publish a human rights report every year, uh, which basically gives case studies and the numbers. So I think, I mean, we all know what's happening, but it's also so important to have that documentation and Paul Loeb and his team are doing that very important work. Yes, and um, Paul Loeb, I think um, International Peace Bureau and then um, uh, I and a group of um, uh, you know, women, indigenous women leaders from seven social cultural indigenous zones, we founded the Global Alliance of Indigenous People, Gender Justice and Peace, um, just to get our issues out there and uh, share it just like we are sharing today. So I think more sharing is needed, you know, uh, because we can't leave everything to the UN. <laughs> we can't leave everything to projects and to UN. It's not going to work. <laughs> So I think we have to also connect uh, with each other through our work, our efforts, um, and visiting each other, you know, getting to know one another. I think we have, I always say, um, nation building cannot be done at the gunpoint, mm -hmm. whether in Northeast of India or in Chittagong. It has to be done actually with a lot of love, but I don't think they have the courage to love. I think they have the courage more to hate and you know, commit this acts, atrocities. And we are just saying, no, that's not gonna work anymore. Um, because I think indigenous people are so strong now, you cannot obliterate us, you cannot, you know. And uh, India has many layers, it's not indigenous, this attack on minorities happening. We all, the different, different energies we have to join together to resist uh, this violence. It's Oh, it's it's a corporatization of our democracies. This violence is too much on our lives. And so uh, people like us who grew up in these conflict zones, we thought things will get better. It has got worse. And that's why the next five, 10 years has to be stronger, what I call a stubborn path towards peace and holding accountability uh, by using good strategies, which I think as Hannah said, Kapang has done very good documentation we have mapped out survivors in the Northeast of India. We have, and, and we are acutely aware of the discrimination going on against the Chakma people in Arunachal Pradesh. We are in touch with the student leaders to stop them. And same thing, I mean, because there's a lot of right wing also in the Northeast of India and with elections round, with every time the election comes, they drum up all the outsiders, you see. So we also have collective work to do together. Um, to say that they have been displaced from their homes because of the violence. So how can we stay subjected to another form of violence again? You know? So we have been advocating for that in the Northeast and you have our support uh, for the people um, from, your, from your country uh, for, for seeking refuge and safety. So please take that from us. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Palab Chakma. Uh, for participating here with us. Uh, this will be recorded as well, so later you can send it to more people to, to extend this collaboration, this cooperation. And as Bina said, please reach out to us so we can keep on talking and keep on collaborating. I'm going oh, to, if excuse me, I'm going to disable you talking. And to close, uh, uh, Bina and Hannah, you mentioned something, but if you could just briefly mention, you have a, a common project that you developed that, uh, about maybe a book, is, if, if I'm not wrong. Could you talk a little bit about this or this is just a surprise for the future? <laughs> Bina, you want to go ahead? Uh, uh... Yeah, it's just, uh, no, this was before the pandemic or the, uh, a group of people came together to write on borders and conflicts. I think borders, indigenous people and all of that. So a book is coming out um, in, in this next near couple of uh, days, uh, months, two books are coming out, which look at borders, indigenous people and conflicts. And the other book we just got launched is called, it's called, um, our indigenous stories, uh, this, so if you have any stories
from Chittagong Hill tracks. Please send them because we are looking at, we just pu published volume one and was launched yesterday. Uh, so what is happening is on one hand, we may be angry and we get sad with all of this. On the other hand, we also need to have stories of resilience. So the book which came out yesterday called the Indigenous Stories tells us, gets uh, stories from seven social cultural indigenous zones of the world. And in the first volume, we had from Asia, from Manipur, and from Burma, Kachin story. But in the second volume, we surely would like to include the voice and the story from Jittagong Hill Track. So if anyone from Jittagong Hill Track loves writing, or if you have any of your folk tales, please send them to us and please be a part of this larger journey together to ensure justice for our people. Um, Bina, I will talk to you later about that book. I'm very interested because I'll, I think I'll connect you with Indigenous activists. I, I'm sure they'll have a lot of, um, they can give you some inputs for that book. Uh, um, and regarding the other book, uh, Tio, I just want to mention that the book is uh, edited by um, um, Cheryl Lightfoot, uh, who teaches at uh, University of British Columbia, and uh, Elsa Stamatopoulo, and I think Tona Blaya is also one of the editors. So they are both actually uh, members of the Chittagong Hill Tracks Commission, where I was uh, a coordinator, but they are also um, teach um, uh, in their respective universities at Columbia University and um, uh, University of Tromso or somewhere in Norway, I'm not sure about uh, Tona. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the book is going to come out very soon. Uh, it has, uh, as Bina mentioned, uh, it's about indigenous peoples and borders. Um, and we had a conference in 2019 and uh, it's basically a, a culmination of those papers that were presented at the conference at that time. So um, I hope uh, we, it will come out soon and we can share it with everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bina. Thank you, Hannah, for participating, for being here, for giving us a little bit of your precious time. It was amazing to hear from my end. I was the one who learned a lot in this discussion. I hope this was enlightening for whoever's participating. That's the intention of the Hidden Conflict series. And I hope you all uh, have a great day, have a great night, and please follow HIAK and AIPB in our social media, in our websites to keep following the work that we are doing in the Hidden Conflict series and in other actions and activities that we organize. Okay? So thank you and goodbye you. to everybody.